Claudia Durastanti, hello. Hi. Raised in the English and Italian languages with deaf parents, you take your readers beyond geographical borders into the worlds of sound and silence. How did you approach writing L'Étrangère, your fourth book, yet the first one translated into French? L'Étrangère, La Straniera, hi. Um, it was a book I refused to write for a very long time. I think I've refused to write it since I developed starting having a storytelling consciousness. I remember I was a little kid. Uh, I moved from New York to a little town in Southern Italy with my mother. Uh, and as soon as we got there, I felt like we landed there, aliens from a spaceship, and people would ask, where do you come from? Who do you belong to? And I realized that the first second I exposed the facts of my life, uh, in a way, my, I would become less interesting because my parents, who were deaf, uh, artists, very quirky characters would absorb all the energies. And I was very worried for this little girl that had a, an attraction <laughs> towards this intimate force within literature, which is the alteration or transfigurations of facts, that she would disappear. So I think I avoided L'Etranger because I thought this book uh, wouldn't come up the way I wanted until I found uh, the right way or sort of interest. Uh, towards my family and I think what was interesting that I didn't set it to write it as a memoir but I wanted it to be a sort of sentimental essay on family lexicon so words sounds and silence being raised in a family with two deaf parents uh, were sort of satellites I worked around and they were the core I would say of how I structured this book which in many ways you can consider it a family saga, but you realize that the pulse of it really has to do with language. You make these two worlds meet when you enter a room of almost perfect silence. You share this experience and push your readers to question not only their perception of a disabled person, but rather how a disability changes the perception of the world for that person. Do you feel that this is something that is too disregarded? I never really thought about it until I started to meditate about deafness. Uh, even the most exceptional circumstances of your life become very banal in a way. They become non-literary when you're immersed in that environment. But at one point I started to observe how subtitles for deaf people work. And something that would come up if there was silence in a scene, you would have the words pop up in brackets, silence. And I always thought, this is something that is described and selected by hearing people for non-hearing people, but what's the middle ground? What silence are we talking about? And I had a mother explaining to me that silence didn't exist as the physical uh, entity that I imagined because her silence was very dirty, was very loud, was very chaotic. Uh, and I couldn't access that space, of course, having this uh, difference being hearing uh, versus a non-hearing mother. I uh, always wrote about music, it's uh, been an interesting of mine, and funnily enough, it was my mother that educated me to music because she was uh, very into punk artists or storytellers, she could read the lyrics, it didn't matter, she couldn't hear them, so my first access to music was very linguistic and verbal. Uh, it had nothing to do with sound, in a way. Uh, and so I found out way before I went into an anechoic chamber, a, sound, a room of perfect silence, that John Cage visited one in Harvard in the 60s. And so he walks into this room of perfect silence and he hears two sounds, a high-pitching sound and a low-pitching sound. And he asked, what is this? And the technician, the sound technician, apparently says, one is the sound of your nerves and the other is the sound of your blood. So there is not so much science <laughs> uh, behind this, but it's a good story in a way. Uh, and years later, I went to the Guggenheim in New York and I've seen this exhibition by artist Doug Wheeler um, that he rebuilt uh, um, an echoic chamber in a complete white space. So it was easy to lose your orientation uh, and I could hear all the loud noises of my body. I could hear my stomach, even my veins. It was a very physical and scary experience. 
And so all of a sudden, I could realize what my, my mother was trying to say to me, that silence was very chaotic and it was very occupied by a lot of noises. Uh, and it was a beautiful moment and I actually was back into her body in a way, which didn't happen since uh, she carried me. And I really was meditating on experimental art, something we consider sometimes too abstract uh as a channel in a way to work around difference and even arrive to the point to erase difference uh, my mother was a painter and she always had despised figurative painting this painting so she would love abstract art and she was not educated and often we think uh, she had no training in art often we think that abstract art is elitist so it's for people who have an understanding of it. And so it's not democratic, it's not popular. I actually think it's the opposite because something so free form, you could feel it with all of the meanings you want to. So in a way for my mother, it was easier to find herself or make meanings out of Rothko rather than a Renaissance painting in a way, which was more prescribed and more normative, if that makes any sense. So for me, experimental music was a very interesting channel to develop my ideas around noise and silence. It also questions the label of ability and disability in the end because physically what we can or cannot do, we all have differences. We do not perceive the world in the same way. It's a matter of scale. Yes, scale is an interesting word. Thank you. Uh, I've been thinking about scale of migration, scale of ability, non-ability, different ability, and every word, uh, all the lexicon felt very insufficient for me. And I think in a very spontaneous way, it felt insufficient even from members of my family. So what was my mother's father trying to do when he was buying to his deaf daughter devices to hear music? You would think that that's a man in denial, but I think uh, being surrounded by these characters <laughs> and my, I call them romantic imposters, that were very reckless in a way. They had um, an almost uh, defiant, constant defying attitude towards definition. And this was true for the words they used for their migration. This was true for all the words they used for belonging. And this was true also for disability. I find it very fascinating that my mother and her brothers, they live apart. She lives in Italy. They live in the States. They've been apart for 50 years by now. And they know they have a deaf daughter. But when my mother goes back to visit them, uh, they are just people that speak different languages in a way. So, uh, it, which is, this is why I was working on the relationship between foreignness, deafness, linguistic different abilities and a different linguistic community in a way. So to me, it was interesting to study in L'Etranger all the environments and spaces where differences uh, collide and for a brief moment they even erase completely. In the book you stress how languages are culturally and personally revealing constructions. How has language shaped your writing of L'Etranger? As a child of migration, and especially as a child of two deaf parents, I was constantly pushed into thinking, uh, do you feel more Italian? Do you feel more American? What language you dream in? What language you work? Uh, and so I felt that all I learned through write, by writing this book and working with language that every binary approach to language doesn't hold up. In a sense, we are all shaped in a polyphonic environment. We have to think about the many middle thongs we have in one mother thong, for example. So this is not necessarily has to do with migration. Even if you stay in place, if you never leave the little town, language is shaped by class. It's shaped by, you know, um, strategies or rhetorical things that people have around it. Uh, and so this is why I call any in the book, I say I was raised in a broken language, uh, a black market of language where everybody was trading their own personal uh, meanings. And it took me a long time, though, to discover this because at the beginning, I was really writing in Italian, thinking about America, thinking about English stories, and I would fall into this faux 
binarism between two different co linguistic cultures. And I don't think that's relevant, not only for my experience as a writer, but for my experience as a human being, mostly. I think we all have conflicting dictionaries within us that are related to all the places that we have crossed, all the people we've crossed. Uh, and maybe often I found it very interesting when what we retain of a person rather than the physical uh, appearance is the way that person speaks or the way that person sounds in a way and the book was also interesting in thinking about lost sounds in a way when I write about my Italian American family I'm describing men women that are mostly passed away right now that had that typical slang from southern Italy a made-up language that never fully landed into English that would retain and make up a new in between sound that is of course disappearing and so if i could do it i would make you know sound archives <laughs> for any made-up language possible besides writing you're also an editor and a translator amongst which of ocean bonk what struck me is the importance of metaphors in both your book and on earth we're briefly gorgeous to him as a cultural way to talk about trauma and to you as one of the two gaps where you would lose communication with your parents as a translator, how do you see your work with a language? Is it merely an affair of words, or is there something beyond what's written? I um, didn't want to translate uh, L'Etranger in English. And I didn't want to do it because being a translator, I realized that translation is often a detective game in a way, so you cannot be the author of a crime and detective solving the crime at the same time. It's about cognitive dissonance in a way. And also, uh, I wanted my translator in English, Elizabeth Harris, and about Ottilie Chapuis, who translated in French, to make it their own work, of course. The book was experimental from the very beginning, even when it came out in Italian. In a way, I wanted to be intersectional. I wanted to see the stretch, the self, the I, up until the point it will no longer matter and someone else would come up forward. So it was about this putting the I in context and then putting out of context. And to me, the art of translation was key in meditating uh, on this book. And when um, I finished writing L'Etranger, I've been asked to translate On Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous. It was a very intense uh, experience in the way that both books are letters to mothers. Ocean's Wong book is an open letter to a mother who cannot read the language he's writing in. And I thought it was super fascinating the way this influenced the story he was setting up in terms of opacity, withholding intimacy being and I was jealous sometimes because I worked knowing that my mother would read it and that was not a matter of censorship I wanted the language to be accessible so compared to my other books I was trying I wouldn't say to tone it down but I wanted under the surface of language and style to be very uh, feverish but I wanted the surface to be accessible so to me that was very important and sometimes this had consequences on the way I worked on lyrical style and metaphors. So, and Ocean Vong's book is just unbound <laughs> in a way. Uh, so it was interesting because it was a mirror experience of translation. And I think that's a unique case. Finally, what book would you invite us to read today? There is a book I love by a very unique, um, undefiable, <laughs> but the book uh, by um, Elizabeth Hordwick. She was a critic, a uh, writer, and it's called Sleepless Nights. I've translated it into Italian and sort of trance state. Uh, the symbolist language is just beautiful, and it's a bizarre book in the sense that it's a, autobi a shattered autobiography and letters, notes, uh, um, fragments of personal journals, made up journals, and it's just into this hypnotic state. It, it came out in the US in the 70s, and I think, still think it feels, it constantly changes its shape, so I really recommend it if you're interested in writers, in this case a woman, that work on the narration of the self in a sort of poetic and experimental way. Thank you very much, Claudia Durastani. Thank you.